Welcome to Herd Around the Barn, where we talk about farmed animals, about food, and about changing the world one bite at a time. I'm your host, Kathy Stevens, founder of New York's Catskill Animal Sanctuary, where hundreds of animals experience what love feels like every single day. Each Wednesday, we chat with a leader in animal rights or in plant-based health and nutrition or an everyday hero doing their part to make the world a more compassionate place for all of us. Thanks for tuning in. And now let's get moving. It takes a special kind of courage and determination and faith and maybe a few other things to open a sanctuary in Iowa, the heart of animal agriculture in this country. Stay tuned for my conversation with Jared and Sean Camp, founders of the first farm sanctuary in the state, not surprisingly called Iowa Farm Sanctuary. So welcome, you guys. Thanks for pulling away from the work that never ends to spend time with Catskill Animal Sanctuary. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited about it. So I'm always interested to speak to sanctuary founders and hear what about their background informs their choice to do this work. And you have such very different stories. Who wants to go first? Jared's is probably more interesting, so I can go first. I was born and raised in Iowa, and um, I grew up living life on the lake. My dad owned a marina, so he kind of instilled the rescue nature in me. Uh, Owning a business on the lake, he was always coming upon wildlife that needed some sort of rescue, which don't do like my dad did. It's not legal, but he would always bring home wildlife. I I, I remember (laughs) bringing home turtles, and it wasn't until... I was an adult, you know, really just looking for my true calling. And Jared and I went vegan. Shortly thereafter, it kind of dawned on us. Farm animals need rescued too. And especially here in Iowa, Uh, there were no other sanctuaries. So we did the most logical thing and put our brand new construction home on the market and ended up buying a, what, an 1890 farmhouse with... A little (laughs) modest 10 acres, and the rest is kind of history from there. (laughs) Now, Jared, meantime, you had a profoundly different childhood, and you're the apple that fell very far from the tree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, tell tell us your story. (laughs) (laughs) So I grew up in uh, Utah. I was part of a typical uh, large Utah um, family. There are nine kids in our family. It was, uh, it was Bless your mama's of- heart. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But yeah, so growing up in Utah um, with the big family, uh, my parents would buy animals at auction um, and we'd raise them for food. And after doing that for a while, we ended up, uh, my brothers and sisters uh, got into 4-H. Um, and typically we did 4-H with the horses that we had, but we did do some 4-H with uh, sheep. So we would go around Utah to different rodeos and different 4-H organizations and show these animals after raising them. You know, it was such a a normal thing when I was a kid. uh, And I I enjoyed it when I was a kid, but not realizing what kind of exploitation I was being a part of. You know, and uh, every year our family vacation was uh, going up to the mountains and going deer and elk hunting. It wasn't until I moved down to Atlanta, Georgia to go to paramedic school that I was separated from that lifestyle. And, you know, the, the last couple of years I, I was involved in hunting, I, I just started feeling really bad. You know, after mm-hmm. I was an animal, um, I'd walk up to it and I just remember feeling this immense guilt that I'd never felt before, knowing that I'd just taken a life. And it really like hit differently um, than, it, than it ever had. And once I got separated from that lifestyle living in Atlanta, that was the big catalyst for me to start changing. Um, I ended up reading a book called A Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser. Uh, it's right on my shelf. And oh my God, it's, it's such an incredible book. It really opened my eyes to the atrocities that happen in the factory farming world, not just to the animals, but to, you know, to the people, to immigrants. And so once I read that book, you know, immediately I vowed never to eat fast food again. And uh, that was back in, I think, 2001. Uh, I was still eating meat, but I didn't go to Taco Bell. I didn't go to Wendy's. I stopped (laughs) doing all that. 
once I started peeling back that onion, it was so interesting to me that I, I started looking into a lot more of factory farming in our food system. And it struck a bell with me and um, ended up going vegan. And, you know, like Sean said, once we were here in Iowa and we were vegan, we're like, let's do this farm animal rescue. Like I've had the background of, of raising farm animals and, you know, Sean has this gigantic heart that wants to help as many animals as we can. And not knowing if it would work, uh, we just kind of went head first into it. And, and we've just been steamrolling ever since. And we've, you know, we've had such an incredible community here come together to support us. Which is so interesting. A little bit later, we're going to talk about Iowa, this entire state built around animal agriculture. Did it give you pause? I know you're a native Iowan, Sean, but did it give you pause? You say not. You say that this conservative farming, salt of the earth community supported this choice. Tell us a little bit about that. That's quite surprising. Yeah, I think our dreams were just so lofty at that time. I mean, people were asking us the most common question we got when we were dreaming of opening a sanctuary. People were like, well, where are you going to get your animals from? And so I think people rallied behind us because they just assumed that we would fail. You know, like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. And also, I know you were originally managing a restaurant and said that the restaurant, which I'm sure served plenty of meat and dairy, offered to hold a fundraiser for you. Yeah. So uh, I was the assistant general manager there. And so we would do these really fancy beer dinners and it would usually involve, you know, like super bougie meat dishes paired with beer. And, you know, we'd sell tickets, $150 a seat or whatever. And so I asked, can we do a vegan one? If it's successful, let me create a vegan menu. Um, So we did a beer dinner for the restaurant and tickets sold out faster than any other beer dinner they'd ever hosted. Isn't that interesting? This was what year? Uh, This was, gosh, 2015. Let's talk about your work. And to provide some context, let me just read a few stats about your state, if you don't mind. These are (laughs) (laughs) from either the USDA or from the University of Iowa. Iowa is the second highest agriculture producing state behind California and is the top pork and egg producer in the nation. There are 85,000 individual farming operations in Iowa. More than 85% of the land is farmed. And this one is the one that really got me. Pigs, cows, and chickens in Iowa produce as much waste as 134 million people. There are only 3 million people in Iowa. I did this math. So in other words, the animals your state grows to feed humans produce 45 times as much waste as all human Iowans combined. Can you just start by saying a little bit about the environmental implications for Iowa? Oh, absolutely. So like you said, just speaking on the urine and the feces alone, the waste that they produce. I mean, they categorize the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and- Tell people what they are for people who might not know. A dead zone is just a place in the ocean where nothing can live. Uh, It has been so polluted that life is not sustainable. The majority of the dead zones there in the Gulf of Mexico have been traced back to Iowa because we have to get rid of that waste and it all goes into the waterways, ends up in the Mississippi, and travels right down into the Gulf. Unbelievable. And you guys, there are dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico that are the size of entire states. I read this a few years ago. So, wow. Yeah. And I mean, they trace it back to our state. To you. Yeah. You. To Iowa. And that's, you know, when we're talking about the ocean, you know, that's the ocean. So, going back to smaller scale and just looking at individual communities within Iowa, the water quality here, our drinking water, the nitrates in it, if we had our well water tested right now, mm-hmm. our well water would be far beyond the EPA's legal limits of what is acceptable for nitrates. Then there's also, you know, more current events with the highly pathogenic avian influenza. We are a state that produces more egg-laying hens than any other state. And 
we have new cases of avian influenza every day. And so these factory farms kill all of the chickens within their farms. And that is equating to millions and millions of birds. And where do you think they're disposing of them? They go into a hole in the ground and decompose again into our waterways. Mm. So just to give people a little bit of background, this newest strain of avian flu, which is not yet zoonotic, it hasn't yet transferred to humans, yet being the operative word, has been found in pockets all around the country. There have been pockets, there have been several cases in our county and surrounding counties. And the USDA right now is requiring that if a single case is reported from a given property that all the birds on that property be killed. So sanctuaries are terrified. And yet the more we come into contact and crowd these animals with the crowding of the animals in in such filthy environments, the greater the risk that these diseases will worsen and will jump species. And I hadn't even thought about just the mass dumping of the bodies. That's absolutely horrifying. It's a nightmare. And I think it was 2016 was the last avian influenza. These massive farms didn't take any lessons away from that because they're still scrambling to try and figure out one, how to exterminate, (laughs) quote unquote, exterminate the animals (sighs) and where to dispose of them. And what are the methods that they are using? Do you know? In the ones that we know of, um, they have used ventilation shutdown. Mm. Yeah. So ventilation shutdown, um, of course, is when they close off all ventilation to the buildings and crank the heat up to an unsurvivable temperature. Horrifying. Uh, And generally it it takes the animals up to what, 24 hours to pass. And (sighs) a lot of them don't. They (sighs) unfortunately survive and suffer for the the full duration of the ventilation shutdown but yeah the the implications of these massive farms here in Iowa I mean it the environmental implications are just horrendous yeah, yeah they've of course uh, to this point this year they've had to kill over five million birds um, just this year because of the uh, the bird flu in Iowa. Ju- in just Iowa. in Iowa. just in, in Iowa. Iowa and you guys yep. Any sanctuary founder or staff person or volunteer will tell you, even if you do not, even if you've never had a relationship with a chicken, any of us will tell you how remarkable they are and how they want their lives and how loving they are and how quirky and how individual and how they feel pain and fear and suffering in the same way that you and I do. So 5 million in just one state because we as a species aren't yet ready to go vegan. Okay, let's let's talk about your work directly. You were the first farmed animal sanctuary in Iowa. Your sanctuary's mission is to infiltrate the epicenter of factory farming. And we already described the epicenter. I'm interested as a a language person. I'm interested in that choice of words. It's almost an aggressive choice of words. So I'm super interested in that word infiltrate, particularly. We've always talked about being on the front lines of the push for veganism here in the uh, center of uh, modern agriculture. We use that word just because it kind of falls in line with what we're doing here. We, We feel like we're on the front lines. And we feel like we're fighting right at the front of this battle. And so good battles are won by infiltrating the enemy. You know, infiltrating is us being the first sanctuary here in Iowa and us spreading the word first. So we're growing from within the center of this area. And so that's how we feel we've infiltrated already. And now we're just spreading our word. And do you consider farmers the enemy? You use the word enemy. No, I think that uh, not farmers. The enemy is the industry, kind of the overall view of it. We're not specifically pointing out family farms or, you know, anything like that. The uh, the enemy is kind of that mindset, the industry. The industry industry and its mindset. Yep. Gotcha. 
Okay. Talk about some of the initiatives that you have launched, are launching in order to try to make the biggest impact in the epicenter of farming. Good Lord, those stats (laughs) woke me up. Our Infiltrating the Epicenter campaign was launched um, in the summer of 2019 with the goal of bringing activism, liberation, and um, education to Iowa. And we got, of course, hit with a pandemic in 2020. And so things kind of got a, a bit derailed as far as those plans went. So we launched this campaign and some of the grand ideas that we have are to bring an animal rights conference to Iowa. Oh, wow. Count me in. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So you talk about infiltrating and what that means to us. We don't need an animal rights conference in Los Angeles where everything is already vegan anyways. Right. Can we bring it here where, I mean, the national pork expo is here in Des Moines every year let's bring an international animal rights conference here, you know, and shake things up from, from where everything is rooted. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that the nation's first ag gag laws were passed and written in Iowa. A lot of standard practices stem from what happens here in Iowa. So the more that we can educate and just be out there and be present um, and shine a light on Iowa it will have a trickle down effect in surrounding areas. I'm really interested in what the reception has been over the years. I was interested that you said at the very beginning, Sean, that the restaurant where you work offered you the opportunity to do a fundraiser there. That was a little surprising to me. Talk about the community, talk about its reception and whether or not you've experienced folks in general becoming more open over the years. Yeah. So I think in the beginning, you know, when we were just a blip on anyone's radar, the community really did rally behind us. The vegans in Iowa really were rallying behind us because we were outspoken vegans at the time. We were, you know, kind of punk rockers and, and uh, I don't know. I think people really rallied behind us. Um, and there was a sizable vegan community. I just, I'm sorry to stereotype your state, but I, I yeah. just, all I picture is corn. There's more than you would expect, let's say. <laughs> um, but I think as we kind of gained momentum, you know, we got the vegan community rallying behind us. Um, And then we were more than just a blip on the radar. And we started running into not issues, you know, within our community per se with neighbors or things of that nature. But there was one instance we went to an overturned turkey truck that was uh, about three miles from the sanctuary. And we went there gloved up, ready to help. And um, the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship came out and just basically kicked us off the scene we know exactly who you are and what you're here for, you know, and they did not want us there. And I bet not, but this was, I, can I assume that this was before you were an official disaster relief partner with the department of transportation? It was during that time. There was an an accident that I was involved in while I was working as a paramedic. And I took a TIMS class is what it's called or TIM. It's a uh, national transportation incident management. It's kind of ubiquitous for all um, for all accidents, um, whether it's you know just vehicles or whether it's livestock. Well, here in Iowa, livestock ac- accidents happen really frequently, and so I was contacted by the DOT after one of our um, one of our um, accidents that we went to, and he knew that I was part of the Tims, and he invited us to come out to one of the uh, DOT meetings and talk um, about our perspective and how we can help, and from there. He said that if they do have other incidents with, with animals, that they would contact us. The problem is the DOT and IDOLS, they're not on the same page with how we can help. IDOLS is the Iowa Department of Ag. I can see that they would want your help from a practical point of view, like get the animals out of the road so that they're yeah. not lots and lots more accidents, you know, pylons. Yeah. But I can't imagine that they'd let you load up your vans and take them to sanctuary. So initially, like Jared said, you know, the DOT and the leaders of the Iowa DOT were very much 
eager to work with us and, and they'd call us when these accidents happened. Since then, laws have been passed that prohibit us from showing up there. Um, <sighs> Don't you quote unquote, take our property. The verbiage of it is, you know, if we interfere, it's very, very, very broad. But if we interfere with uh, the transport, we can be arrested. The law is livestock animal transport interference. And it just, it doesn't define interference. And we actually were working with the Animal Legal Defense Fund. This was something that Mm -hmm. they've been challenging since, you know, it came up on the table. And the the language is just so loose that it passed with flying colors because everybody's like, yeah, don't jump in front of a semi. That seems... (laughs) you know, like I'm going to sign. It seems not, it's not controversial, but what they don't realize is that it does in fact make it potentially illegal for vigils to be held outside of slaughterhouses. And we can potentially be arrested if we show up to help animals on the side of the road. Has, have you had the opportunity to test the law or would you test the law? Like I said, um, we were contacted by the Animal Legal Defense Fund about this particular law, and the attorney who sits on our board is working with the Animal Legal Defense Fund to try and get this thrown out, or at the very least, have some more explicit language about what constitutes interference. Okay. You also step in in things that are still called natural disasters, even though so many of in quote unquote natural disasters are connected to global warming, which is man-made. Talk about helping animals in natural disasters. Who, who's at highest risk? Are there times of the year that are most concerning? Do you have any particular stories that can shed light on what that work is like? Yeah. uh, Here in Iowa, the most common natural disaster that we're going to see is, and and the most deadly for farm animals is going to be flooding. There's also, of course, the occasional tornado and then um, extreme cold weather. But I would say flooding is, is the most common risk around here. Two years ago, we did a massive rescue. There is a, you know, typically when floodwaters come up, these owners of animal confinements put chains around their doors and lock the animals in and the water comes up. And when they come back, all the animals are deceased and they get to write it off as an insurance claim. Um, So there was an instance um, a few years ago where the west side of Iowa and the east side of Nebraska flooded terribly in the spring. And a farmer, I suppose you could say he made a compassionate decision to open the doors of his Mm -hmm. hog farm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so these animals had an opportunity to survive and a lot of them did, but then there was really no ways for an average car to access the farm after the water receded. I mean, it was feet of mud. Um, And Mm -hmm. so uh, we were able to do a flood rescue there. And I would say that's kind of the biggest thing we're geared up for. Tell us about that. That must've been so intense. Oh my gosh. It was so intense. And so like profoundly meaningful. It it was, I mean, you really (sighs) can't convey what it is so hard to put to words, what those kind of rescues truly entail. You know, we got there and we had to walk a bit of distance. Um, You know, like I said, it was pretty impassable with equipment and we get there and there were dead pigs everywhere. There were pigs that were stuck in the mud and were skin and bones, but still alive. Um, There were piglets. I mean, all the animals were intact. And so I think there were babies born, you know, Mm -hmm. in the floods. Um, And, and so, you know, it's just this like huge, massive overwhelm at first, because there's so many animals and there's only so much you can do in eight hours of daylight, you know? And Mm -hmm. um, so you start triaging and working through mud. I mean, it was a monumental task. And then, you know, the farmer shows up and we had permission from the sheriff to be there, but the farmer showed up. And after we had been moving, 
these pigs for hours through the mud and trying to coax them where they needed to go, the farmer came and ran them off in, I mean, in 10 seconds flat, they, these pigs, we lost them and it had taken us hours to move them, you know, and it, it was just the most exhausting rescue. And, but it was very, very satisfying. And ultimately the farmer did release um, one of the critically ill animals to us um, and we were able to get them to the vet and she is still happy and healthy. So out of all that monumental effort, are you telling me that because of the farmer's actions, you were ultimately only able to help one? Yep. yep. And, and that is, oh you know, we, we were there with our big horse trailer and, and the sheriff was there working with us to move these animals. And yeah, we, we were ready to load up the trailer and the farmer got there. And I mean, he was so upset with us. There was saliva flying out of his mouth into our faces as he cursed at us. I, I, it, it was just unbelievable. So ultimately the sheriff had to convince him that, you know, we were there to help. And so we did take one animal. Let's talk about something happy for a minute. Let's <laughs> talk about a couple of the animals who call IFS their home. Do you want, I, I have a list of Patrick, Augie, and the unsinkable Molly Brown. Tell us about them. Okay, so Molly Brown is a really cool story. She's wonderful. She's a big girl and she, we always joke that she wears the pants because she actually has, she's looks like a normal Yorkshire pig, very pink, but she has a gray strap around her belly that makes her look like she's wearing pants. So cute. Molly Brown wears the pants. Um, she came from actually a truck wash when she was 21 days old. She survived. A truck wash? Yes. yes. What is that? you know, when these pigs are 21 days old, they're weaned, quote unquote weaned, and lots of air quotes here, taken from their moms and then taken to a facility to be fattened. Molly Brown somehow hid behind the door in the semi when they unloaded all these piglets. They oh, them. and when they went in to clean the truck, they found yes. her? Yeah, so they oh, they, wow. um, they close in the sides so that they can flood the, the truck, the trailer, and, you know, they kind of let the water marinate and then they open it up and all the water comes rushing out. And here comes six pound Molly Brown swimming out of the back of the semi. This is why you named her. So tell, tell, tell everybody who Molly Brown from history is. Okay, so oh, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Molly Brown historically was a very famous philanthropist who was on the Titanic. And so to my knowledge, I think she kind of helped load the women and children before herself onto the lifeboats. And you guys, pigs are great swimmers. So, yeah. oh, what a great, so that's lovely. All right. The unsinkable <laughs> Molly Brown. How old now? How old and how big? Oh gosh, she is going to be four. And how big? She's 600-ish pounds. Yeah, that's, I was going to guess, I was going to guess 500 if she's that old and she's a Yorkshire. Do you want to talk about Patrick or about Augie? Oh, let's talk about Augie. We have an Augie, by the way. Do you? Baby goat. Baby Aww. goat. <laughs> um, Augie has something called hypotrichosis. He's a special needs cow. What is it? So the hypotrichosis is a, uh, it's like a hairless um, condition. Um, it's genetic and it just prevents his hair from growing, either growing in fully or it's extremely fine. So in the summertime, um, his skin is exposed. So we have to put sunscreen on him. Um, and when he was really sure. young, he had just a completely bald forehead and <laughs> we had we bought a little hat for him to keep the sun off of his head because he would turn pink within 30 minutes of being outside. And then also here in Iowa, we get some really cold winters um, in the cattle or the cows. Oh, and he doesn't uh, grow any coat. Need, yeah, they need to grow their winter coat and he just can't do it. So he gets extremely cold. So where does he so, live? 
He lives. Uh, <laughs> well, when he you was know young, where he lives, I know where he lives. I have a funny feeling. I know where he lives. Yeah. yeah, when he was young, he lived in the house with us, and he was the best roommate ever. He never cleaned up after himself, though, which was not okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but now uh, at the new sanctuary we have, we actually um, have a location in between our house and our garage. Um, it's like a little sunroom that we turn into his little winter retreat. So he's got a wall heater. He gets to wear a coat. No. Uh, Go yeah. Augie. He's spoiled. <laughs> and I'm um, sure we can see lots of photos of him on your website, right? Yeah, he's he's one of our, yeah, he's one of our most famous animals. People love him. All right, one more thing, and then I'm going to let you go. You have a cookbook coming out. It's called Kind Eats, a vegan cookbook from the kitchens of Iowa Farm Sanctuaries volunteers. Very exciting. We have a cookbook. There are not too many farm sanctuaries that have cookbooks. It was a Herculean effort to create our cookbook. Yours is a little different because it's recipes from volunteers. Tell us about the book, about the process of selecting the recipes. Just tell us about the book. Okay, so this, uh, this was a passion project of a uh, board member of ours and also kind of tied into that, you know, the infiltrating the epicenter campaign. Um, we wanted to educate people on vegan cooking. Um, so it wasn't a book per se, it was gonna be uh, recipes on our website. Still in the works. I believe we've got some really great recipes. Um, that's kind of something that Jared and I aren't really involved with, but- to- it Gotcha. Okay, before we go, I want to know if there are any upcoming events or campaigns you'd like listeners to be aware of. Our next event is our spring picnic, which we haven't been able to host since 2019. It's one of our most coveted events. Um, so it's a great name, the picnic. Yeah, <laughs> we love you. it. We have guest speakers. A big silent auction, a vegan grill out. It's just a big event where people come out and get to meet the animals. And what's the date? It's uh, May 14th this year. And um, our guest speakers we're really excited about. We have Sol Eubanks, uh, who is a big time animal advocate um, out of Atlanta. And then Dr. Crystal Heath, who is a vegan veterinarian, which you and I both know is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and then we've got Gene Bauer, who is kind of the pioneer of the Farm Sanctuary movement. He is the pioneer, co-founder of Farm Sanctuary and still out there changing hearts and minds and behavior, just like you guys. Okay, um, so picnic on May 14th, tickets in advance, how get people get tickets online or can they just show up? on our website, iowafarmsanctuary.org, and they are available now. Okay, and any other social media you wanna share with us so people can follow what you do? We're pretty searchable, just Iowa Farm Sanctuary on Instagram and Facebook are the two that we use. Great. a little too old for TikTok, but we're trying really hard. We're trying. We're trying with TikTok. <laughs> Somebody who's much younger than I am is in charge of TikTok. Um, <laughs> Sean and Jared, give my love to those precious animals. And um, I really look forward to staying in touch. Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks, thank Kathy. you. We really appreciate it. Sure thing. Good luck at the picnic. Uh, thanks. thanks. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, We hope you'll subscribe, share it with friends, and review it wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about the work of Catskill Animal Sanctuary or to book an in-person visit or a stay at our beautiful bed and breakfast, go to casanctuary.org. Have a beautiful day and see you next week.